And then uh, we'd love to hear from all of you. So we'll have some time for, for Q&A and, and we can do some more, more introductions then. Does that sound good? Yeah, yes. Okay, let me... Okay, so can you all see my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. So I'm gonna kick things off just by setting some context. So over the years, we have, we have gone through many different methodologies and the way we build products today is fundamentally different from where we were um, going back just a few decades, but I'm gonna go back even further just to give a brief history of how we have developed products. So going back into the early 20th century, a lot of the emphasis was on the factory. A lot of the emphasis was on mass production. So we took products that we had, everyday products like razors and cars, and we were trying to mass produce them in factories. And so efficiency was the name of the game, and unfair advantages in those days was all about being able to produce the most number of units at the lowest cost. And so around that time, out of constraints in Japan, a lot of the early ideas uh, that uh, were, were created by uh, Toyota and, and Edwards Deming. Uh, Taichi Ono eventually went into what became lean manufacturing. So that's where that kind of originated. As we moved um, you know, further down 20 years later, we began working with software. Things began to become more digital, but we didn't know anything about software. So we used the same processes that we would to build physical products to software. And so we had a very waterfall-like approach. Some of you may have lived through that era. It was a very staged approach. So this kind of gives you a view of what that might have looked like. There was a, a set phase where we went and talked to customers, gathered requirements, then we went away for a long period of time to build stuff, and then we released things out, and that's where we did our market validation. So there were finite stages for each activity and you couldn't really go back and do lots of changes because exchanging things were very expensive. If you were building a bridge or in a factory, you couldn't go back and redesign things. And so when we did software that way, we kind of lived in that same, same, same type of a model. Um, that eventually began to break down as customer needs outpaced the cycle time of waterfall. Uh, so when we got into the early 90s and 2000s, um, PC computing was on the rise. Um, eventually, the internet came into, into play. And with those technologies, it became impossible to be able to deliver something that customers wanted. Um, the needs would change mid-cycle, and requirements would all be changing. And so change management became the name of the game. And that's what Agile was all about. So a number of competing uh, methodologies were developed back then, eventually all codified under the umbrella of, of Agile in 2001. And that was the iterative era. So that's where we would build products in stages. And the idea here was to involve customers throughout the product development cycle. So take a big project, break it into smaller pieces, build a little bit, get some feedback, build a little bit, get some feedback. And so that was the iterative era. And that worked really well until we entered this new phase that we are in. And that's where this happened. So once we moved away from shrink wrap software, once we moved away from delivering things in the box to delivering things over services, which is the world we live in today. Uh, once we were able to talk to customers anytime, anywhere, on many different channels, um, the pace of customer needs, pace of customer demand just exploded. And so even Agile could not keep up. And so this is where lots of people began to experience that we, got, we have gotten very good at building products but the products we are building are fundamentally things that nobody wants. They're fundamentally things that don't kind of hit that customer need. And that sparked some of the ideas in customer development and lean, what eventually became the lean startup kind of around the 2009, 2010 timeframe. And that's kind of continued on till this day. Um, a lot of the ideas from lean startup are still principles that we are trying to figure out, are still principles we are trying to put into practice. And so that's, uh, that's an ongoing thing, and a lot, lots of things have evolved and changed over time, uh, but that's where we live today. And so to give you a visual of what that phase looks like, it looks a lot like Waterfall, but very shrinked down. So you can see that in Waterfall, we had a very big cycle time um, in the build phase. In the lean startup or the continuous model, the continuous innovation model, we are putting things out in front of customers continuously. 
we are gathering requirements, we're building, we're releasing, we're doing market validation, all kind of sometimes in parallel, sometimes all at once. And that's what this new phase is all about. And that's what we're going to talk about uh, today. So in the old world, uh, it, the, the, the waterfall approach, the agile approach used to work because even if you got the product wrong the first time, there wasn't lots of competition. There was time to learn. There was time to recover. The barriers to entry were really, really high. Now things have changed. Now if you stumble, and we've seen this happen with many big companies over the last 10, 15 years, but even when, when the big companies stumble, it's not just one or two products that fail. Their business models can potentially get disrupted in the process. And that's what these studies have shown, is that in the last 15 years, you can look at the Fortune 500 companies here in the US, and many of them have just gone extinct. Um, the lifespan of companies used to be 75 years. Now it's down to 15 years. There's a prediction that that's going to shrink even further. And a lot of this is just because of this rapid demand that we are not able to meet with the products we're building and customers have lots more choices than they have today. So they, are, they, are, they don't have as much patience as they would in the past. If a company like Nokia or Blackberry or Blockbuster doesn't serve their needs, they'd go to the competitors, they'd go to the Apples, they'd go to the, uh, the, the Netflix of the world, or they'd go to digital photography in the case of Kodak. Um, and so that switching has been happening quite a bit recently and that's just the pace of what happens if you don't adopt these new types of these two, this this new type of continuous innovation. Now, on the other hand, in parallel, what we also see is the rise of startups, and lots of the startups are really the ones challenging these bigger companies. And I call this the global entrepreneurial renaissance. As we are seeing more and more startups in the last four or five years, I've had the privilege of being able to travel to many different parts of the world. And I've seen lots of entrepreneurs everywhere I've gone. I've seen people that may look different, may speak, may speak different languages, but for the first time in a, in a very long time, we all have access to near equal access, I should say, to tools, knowledge. Um, it's cheaper and faster to build products thanks to the internet, cloud computing, all the things you're familiar with. And so people can start a company anywhere these days. And that's been a, been a, uh, you know, both a blessing for, for, for all of us and a curse, of course, for the bigger companies who, if they don't get their game right, they can get disrupted uh, pretty quickly. So startups are definitely um, taking advantage of, of this, these newer types of thinking, but we're also seeing lots of big companies are adapting to this. So you're seeing companies that were startups maybe 20 years ago, like Amazon started in 1994. Um, they started off with a simple idea of selling books, and now they, 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 they sell a lot more than books. But if you look at their culture, a lot of it is in this mindset of rapid experimentation. You can see the code down below by Jeff Bezos, and he describes a lot of their new successes to be the result of experiments that they are running, uh, not just yearly, but monthly, weekly, daily. Um, they're, while they started out in books and eventually moved into many aspects of e-commerce, they also did the Amazon Web Services. They also have Amazon Prime. Both of those were, were deemed as bad ideas by lots of, uh, uh, lots of very smart people when they were starting out. Uh, but they persevered and they proved that those models could actually work. And that was just this nature of rapid experimentation. They were willing to make big bets on, on those, those different ideas. If we go to a different startup story, you know, 10 years later, Facebook was started um, kind of uh, in, in, in the same realm, um, doing lots of rapid experimentation. If you look at the code here, today Facebook runs so many experiments, there's not just one version of Facebook running at any given point, there are 10,000. And it's not just these two companies, there are lots of other companies that are also embracing this idea of experimentation and not execution. So the old model used to be, let's create this perfect plan, it was a very top-down model, let's execute on that plan. The new model, because the pace of change is so fast, it's, assume, it's, it's basically um, admitting that we may not know where the next big idea is going to come from, so let's use this experimental mindset to uncover that. So you can see a lot of names here, which I'm sure many of you will recognize. It's this mindset of rapid experimentation. So if you look at the common thread across all of these, uh, these companies, all of these stories, um, we see one thing, and that is that the new unfair advantage is no longer speed of execution, it's no longer executing a plan, but rather it's speed of learning. So if you can outlearn the competition, you stand to win. Because if you can outlearn the competition, 
you build what customers want. You, if you can continuously do this, not just one time, but continuously do this with your customers, you, you stay relevant with them. You disrupt yourself before other people do, and that's kind of the new game that we're in, is if you aren't moving fast, someone else will move faster than you. Um, so you have to stay relevant to your customers, and that's the way you protect your business model. That's the way you see growth in your business model. Now, this requires change. Now, a lot of you I know in the room are, are startups, and so you really have a clean slate, and so you can learn some of these, these, uh, these new best practices or these new principles right from the start. Um, but it still requires some change because we have gone through lots of training. Lots of you I know have gone through you know, very good schools, and we are taught to build things a certain way. We are taught to, taught to build things around lots of analysis and lots of planning. Unfortunately, in this new world, those things don't always stand up. Um, so one of the things that we strongly believe in is the, is the no business plan approach. And by no business plan, I'm not saying don't do any planning. I make a very clear distinction between business planning and the business plan. Uh, what I'm really talking about here is trying to create this perfect model that you're going to execute, trying to create this perfect plan that you're going to then put into place because you, you're able to see everything in the future, and that's just not possible. So in, in this new world, when we're moving really, really fast, there's lots of uncertainty. And when there's lots of uncertainty, it's not a static plan that's going to help. Rather, it's more of a dynamic model. So you have to be able to change on the fly. You have to be able to change rather rapidly. So if we look at the tools that are being used in both of these instances, previously we would worship the business plan because that was this big document we would write. Again, that model worked when we could see, uh, when we had time to do a lot of the analysis, when we had, didn't have as many competitors, uh, when they weren't uh, you know, people like, uh, that, that were kind of on the, on the uh, back of our heels trying to take over or disrupt our business model. In the new world, all that changes. So in the new world, it's really all about these dynamic business models. Now, this is a, is a, 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 a playbook that's taken right from the scientific method. If you look at the way science is done, and that was a big inspiration for both the original lean thinking as well as the lean startup, is that if we think in terms of experiments, writing experiments is not the most important thing. All scientists start with a problem they want to solve and then they dig into models and try to build models that help them predict the future. And then they run experiments to either validate, and if you follow the scientific method, it's really more looking for invalidation because when you find inv invalidation, you can then correct your judgment and get to a much better model. And so that's the way science works. And we can almost apply that same kind of thinking to business models. So the previous approach was let's build this perfect plan and just execute it because we can see into the future. Um, in this new model, it's more let's build this business model and it's a small dynamic thing. I, a number of you may have been ex exposed to the business model canvas or the lean canvas. That's one example of a business model. Um, it's also one aspect of a business model. There's more to it. Uh, we can get into more, more details with the, with the business, but this gives you at least one, one artifact that you can look at. You can begin to tell the story of your business. You can begin to talk about your idea, not just in terms of what you're going to go build, but what are you uh, going to build? Who are you going to go build it for? So those are your customers. Uh, what problems do you solve? How do you take this to market? How do you make money? So we can describe all these things using this model and like the scientific model, they are tools that we use to make predictions. What we're essentially saying is, if we go after these kinds of customers who have these types of problems, this solution could potentially work. Of course, we have to come and validate that um, or invalidate that, but that's fundamentally what, what the first step is. It's let's first create um, some kind of a model. Now, when we're creating these models, unlike the business plan, we aren't looking for perfection. So I love Legos. My, my kids play with us. We've got Legos all over, all over the house. Uh, but I love this analogy because it gives this impression that we are really trying to solve a puzzle. We're really trying to put together some models that may look very simple in the beginning. But once we get good at creating simple models, we can also create more complex models. Uh, this, by the way, is, a, as you can see, a life-size uh, X-Wing fighter from Star Wars built not with giant Lego pieces, but really small ones. And so you can you can, with enough perseverance, with enough practice, be able to do things like this, also with tools like this. Um, so we can use a tool like a Lean Canvas not just to describe a very simple business model, but also more complex, multi-sided marketplace types of models. 
Um, we may require multiple canvases, but you can begin to, to, to model those types of interactions as well. Um, so that's the power of these kinds of tools is that they're not meant to describe things with certainty, but at least give you a better working model, which you can then begin to test. Now, once we have this first step done, once we have the business model story down, we then go into stage two, which is not doing the easy stuff. So I know a lot of you in the room are probably come from some kind of product background or product mindset or engineering mindset. Um, if you were building a really hard, if you were tackling a really hard technical problem, you wouldn't start with the easy stuff because you can do the easy stuff anytime. We have to take that same mindset of product development to business model development. Because if you are trying to build a business, we don't want to do the easy things because we can do that anytime. Today, building product is easier than it was before. I'm not saying it's just a given and every product is simple, but it's easier than it used to be before. The bigger challenge is not can we build something, but should we build something? And that's the, that's the big question today. And so it's a lot like playing this game, which some of you may have played, the game of Jenga. It's about trying to build a model, trying to build a tower in this case, uh, removing all the weakest links. So we're trying to get rid of all the riskiest assumptions first, remove those out of the picture, and then what we have is a solid structure that kind of stands on its own. Um, that's fundamentally what that riskiest assumption step is all about. So don't tackle what's easiest, tackle what's riskiest. The way we actually test that is using experiments. So this is the experiment, this is a scientific method just adapted for, for the, uh, the entrepreneurial method. So start with the model, make some predictions, identify what's riskiest, not what's easiest, and then tackle that. And then use experiments to then mitigate those risks. So we're going to use experiments to test what might be riskiest. Um, some of those risks will change over time, and then that's where you get the feedback loop. So you may find that something that was risky today may not be risky tomorrow because you've addressed it. Now the risk moves somewhere else, and then we tackle that systematically. So this tries to bring a little bit more of that engineering mindset to business uh, creation. This is not all art. There's actually some science to it as well. I'm sure there's a lot of intuition and gut that's still required, but we can test those things as well. And this is where the world of metrics comes in, because if you build something and customers don't react in a measurable way, then we know that maybe we haven't built the right thing. And so that's what this new methodology is, is fundamentally about. Something else that you also see is once we take this more experimental mindset, we don't have to take many big bets. So in the past, it was very typical to find big companies doing this. It was very typical to find entrepreneurs doing this as they would have to take a big loan or raise a lot of money and make one big bet. And if that big bet didn't pan out, um, it would be a big wipeout failure. Nobody would work with that entrepreneur because that would be a big um, kind of scar. It would be, a, it would, it would be this big taboo. Um, we live in a, a new world now where you can make many small bets and you can do them in parallel as well. So if you see the way investing is happening, if you see the way even corporates are innovating, um, at least the more, more progressive ones, they're not making uh, as many big bets on one or two ideas. They're doing lots and lots of small bets. And so the example I shared early on with Facebook is an extreme example of that. They are actually essentially admitting that nobody in the company knows what is the right direction, even Mark Zuckerberg at this point. Um, so we're going to run 10,000 experiments every single day. And one of those experiments is going to be better because we're split testing everything. One of them is going to be better than, than the other 9,999, and we're going to double down on that one. So that's essentially what this concept of the best way to find a big idea is to quickly test lots of ideas is fundamentally about. The thing we want to avoid, or the thing I should say we want to do, is get to the, the maximum possible outcome as quickly as possible. So if you are from a computer science or mathematics background, you may have run into the hill climbing problem. Um, that's essentially what we are trying to avoid, is we're trying to avoid the local maxima. Because if you are just executing on one idea, it, it, it's possible that you get some validation, it's possible that you even get customers, but if you don't really get it to a point where it's going to give you the return that you're expecting, um, it's hard to see that in the early stages, especially when you're blindfolded or when you are tunnel vision. So this is why in this new approach, we don't start with one business plan or just one idea. We really recommend starting with many of them in parallel. And what I mean by that is that for every one of you that creates a Lean Canvas, it's a good exercise to look for variants. It's a good exercise to look for what else could we use this technology for? What else could we use these or which other customers could we go after? 
what other problems could be solved, what other business model kind of revenue stream combinations could we come up with. And all those variants are worthwhile testing. And we can do a lot of this testing in parallel. So in the beginning, when you create your canvases, you are essentially making a guess. Now you can make lots of guesses. Some of them are going to be poor guesses and depending on your resources, you can work on all of them. So you may prioritize maybe your top three or top five, and then you begin to identify what's risky on each one. It could be different. Some of them could have more technical risk. Some of them could have more customer or market risk. And you kind of use that to then this, uh, kind of move down this path of validation. So this is where you begin to systematically test the model. Along the way, some are going to be more promising. Some are going to get invalidated. And you can see a natural narrowing down will begin to happen because we can work on a lot of things in parallel for a long time, but it's a great way to start because the first phase is all about search. It's not about execution. It's about searching for what is the most promising idea, what is the most promising customer need or customer problem that we need to solve. Um, we then double down and then we take that to scale and then you, have, of course, have lots of options. You can come back and revisit some of your early ideas. You can come back and expand your, your customer segment or expand your problem to a much wider domain, build multiple products, and that's just the nature of how companies grow, is that most companies that grow don't just stay with one product, they eventually start to add a whole bunch of, of different products in their portfolio, a whole bunch of different customer segments in their portfolio. But this is at least is a starting picture. This is the picture that you can go through when you're starting from just one idea. Now, the last thing I want to share with you, and then we can go into to, to questions, and I can, I can answer any, any, any other questions you might have about anything I've covered. Uh, but the last thing I want to share with you is a key mindset shift. So a key mindset shift that one needs to internalize is avoiding this right here. I call this the innovator's bias or the entrepreneurial bias. And it's something that all humans have, is that when we see a problem in the world, we immediately jump to a solution. Um, Unfortunately, oftentimes that first solution is not the optimal solution. That first solution is often even the wrong solution. Um, entrepreneurs have this in, in, a, in, a, in a more acute sense, is that when they see a problem, they not just jump to a solution, but they start acting on it very, very quickly. The danger with that is that you can spend lots of time, money, and effort building something that nobody wants, which is the danger we got into, is that now it's cheaper and faster before, even though... You know, constraints are always things nobody likes, but the constraint of not having money or the constraint of products being hard to, hard to build required you to write a business plan, required you to go and convince someone else first. And in retrospect, that was a good thing because you could actually um, avoid a lot of the big, you know, big bang failures that we see sometimes now because people just rush into building. Um, so that's kind of the, the, the dark side of all of this is that it's, it's very easy to build products now we are building more products than ever before, but if you don't take the requisite time to really nail the problem or understand what it is that you are trying to achieve, it can be, it can be uh, more easy to build, start building something and pretty soon weeks become months and months can become years. And the danger with that is our passion kind of keeps us going, our perseverance and grit keeps us going. Um, and while those are good qualities, they need to be channeled in the right way. So if you think of it this way, if you simply start with a solution, it's like building a key without a door. I mean, sure, you have a nice looking key and it's, it, you know, potentially it's going to open some doors, but you don't know which doors it's going to open. So you start with technology, you build something amazing in your mind, but then you have to go find the doors to open. If you just flip that around, um, which is something that I've learned to do over the years, I, like all entrepreneurs, I started with, with a lot of key building. Um, and learned over the years that it's fundamentally the secret of all of this is starting with doors or problems worth solving first. Because if you can find a customer who has a problem, the key building becomes a lot easier. Um, if there are enough customers out there, they actually want you to build the keys and they tell you exactly what you need to do. They actually give you lots of feedback along the way, which is where this methodology really shines. Is if you can involve customers in the process, you can actually begin to build keys that open doors that take you places. And so this for us is a lot of what the new mantra is about, is it's really trying to fall in love with the problem, find ways to find a big enough problem worth solving, a big enough customer segment worth addressing. And if you immerse yourself in that environment, I guarantee you're going to see problems. And if you have a, an entrepreneurial DNA, you're going to then be wired to look for solutions. And that's where the biggest opportunities really lie.
So if you look at the Lean Canvas more closely, if you look at even the logo kind of back in this slide over here, you'll see the areas that I shade are the problem and the customer, and that's because of this insight. That's because of this, this, uh, this mindset shift that needs to happen, is that if we just start with solution, we are building that key, but if you start with customers and problems, you're really trying to build things in, the, in that right order. Um, it's not always possible. Sometimes we do start with the technology, and I'm not saying that this is the only way. I'm just saying this leads to, to better outcomes. Even if you start with a solution, there's no, there's no reason why you can't hit the pause button and try to answer these questions about who the customer are and what problems are you solving first. Uh, because if you don't do that, a lot of things get invalidated very, very quickly. If you're building something that there's no customer for, it's easy to see how your channels or your revenue streams don't make any sense. Your solution will eventually not make any sense. The value proposition won't. Everything on this canvas will just begin to fall apart. The business model is doomed. So you have to start with that foundation. So those two pillars on the right, to me, are the places where I always start. Because when I look at any team, if I look at any lean canvas, what I really want to get answers to are these four fundamental questions. I want to know who is their customer. So what I'm looking for there is how big of a market is this? You know, is the addressable market kind of big enough where you can build a sizable business. Now, when I say sizable, I'm not going to give you a number because I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. I believe there are problems everywhere and there are problems of all sizes. You may build a billion dollar business, you may build a hundred million dollar business, you may build a $10 million business or even a hundred thousand dollar business. And to me, all of those are you know, perfectly valid. Someone may just want to quit their day job and become a, a, a business owner and that's their goal and that's what they want to do and that's perfectly fine but you have to start with that goal in mind. So what I'm looking for is does the entrepreneur or does the team know what they want to achieve eventually? And does that customer segment represent a big enough market for that opportunity or for that, for that need? Um, then down below, I want to understand if, if they know who their early adopters are going to be. Early adopters are very critical because they help you really uh, test the initial product. They help you really build uh, your minimum viable product and get better and doing that, so very critical to know who they are. Then what are the top problems of the early adopters? Not yet of the mainstream segment if you're starting out, but what are the top problems of your early adopters? And then how do they solve the problem today? That's where the existing alternatives come from. So existing alternatives is code for competitors, but I don't use the word competitors because when I do, too many people will list the other startups that are in their space. And the problem with that is that startups are like you, they might be just as clueless as you are, and even though you are competing against them and moving in different, a different direction, you may still be moving in the wrong direction at 100 miles an hour, 100 kilometers an hour, and just go off a cliff. So we want to avoid this assumption that we know who our competition is. The best way to extract your competition is by really talking to your customers, is by really interviewing them and seeing how are they solving a problem today. Now, if, you're, if your startup competitors come up in that list, then by all means, you have to anchor and price against them. But if they don't come up in that list of how they are doing things, then for all intensive purposes, those competitors don't really exist. So that's kind of the mindset that you need to have. Um, also, the other reason I call it existing alternatives is that too often your competition is something you don't even think it is. Um, so I've seen lots and lots of startups get killed, not by other startups or by other big companies, but by simple tools like email and spreadsheets. Um, if you're building analytics software, collaboration software, you go into too many organization settings where people are just using email or people are just using a spreadsheet, and the competition is that. It's not how do I build a better collaboration tool than the startup down the street, but how do I replace email or how do I replace uh, a spreadsheet? And those tools are free, they're everywhere, and that's what you're going up against. And that sometimes is a much harder competitor than that startup. So that's why I call it existing alternatives. And uncovering that is going to be key in understanding how you're going to replace them with what you are trying to offer. Uh, this idea of problems versus solutions also manifests itself in the way we launch and grow products. Uh, the reason the hockey stick curve is flat in the beginning, in the past we'd say it's because people are just uh, struggling, they all want to get to the right-hand side. Well, the reason it's flat in the beginning is whenever you bring something new to market, we often have to start by finding problem solution fit. Um, it's always a search. It's always a search for who are the right early adopters and what is the right problem that we need to solve for them that kicks this hockey stick curve. 
Um, you can get to the right-hand side. We all would like to be on the right-hand side, but you can't get there without going through the other phases first. So the first phase is that boring flat portion, but it, while it may seem like nothing is happening, that's where a lot of learning happens. That's where a lot of experimentation happens. That's where a lot of the customer interviewing, the qualitative learning happens, which then leads to you understanding which customers to really go after, what minimum viable product to start with, and that enters, that enters us into the second phase uh, where we spend several more months trying to build that minimum viable product and trying to take it to some point where it begins to deliver sufficient value that we can prove the business model working. So it's not yet scale, but it's enough to what we call product market fit. And then we enter the scale stage and that can last you know, up three years, four years, five years. If you're lucky, it can last you know, a decade. And if you look at companies like you know, Facebook and Amazon, all of those have been around for a long time. And that's because their, their scale trajectory has been growing for many, many years. They've also added lots of new things. And so there's, of course, there's gonna be lots of new products and new, new things that you add to make yourself relevant uh, to customers. Uh, but the mindset is that all of those companies, although the mindset to keep in, in mind is that all those companies didn't get to scale before the millions of users, there was just one user. Um, and that's the thing to keep in mind. We all start the same way and we all start in that left-hand part of this picture. So embrace that. Don't think of that as a painful phase you don't want to be in. That's actually a gift. That's a phase where you can stand to learn the most. And if you can do the right type of learning, it gets you into phase two and phase three um, after that. So I want to end with a, a quick case study. So I often like to um, share this case study. I, I can't see all of you. So I'm just going to um, kind of talk through this one because it's sometimes good to get some of your, your thoughts. But I'm going to kind of give you this case study and then we'll, we'll pause and, and take some questions and, and answer them that way. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm assuming that most of you know Elon Musk. Most of you know he's been up to um, you know, running three companies in parallel, maybe now two. Uh, but Tesla is, is one of those companies. And the big vision behind Tesla is building an all-electric vehicle. Um, started, he, he took over the company in 2006 um, as the CEO. And, and one of the things he had put out as his vision was building an all-affordable electric car. Now, um, like, a, like, like a lot of entrepreneurs, there were lots of risks in that, in that initiative. Um, even though you may say he had lots of resources to start with, he was already a successful entrepreneur, had, had lots of money to invest in the company, there were still lots of challenges. Is building a car is no easy feat. And so the, if we were applying this methodology, if we were starting with problems, not solutions, the thing we want to do is not fall in love with the electric car we're going to go build and just go build it and tell the world how amazing it is, but really try to understand what it's going to take to build that first car. Um, what is the riskiest assumption? What would cause somebody to, to switch from an existing alternative, which in this case would be either a petrol powered vehicle or it would be a hybrid vehicle of some sort to an all electric car? What is that, that, what, what is that switching going to take? That is fundamentally the question. The other way to ask this question of what is the riskiest assumption if you're starting out, um, I often tell people to think not of how they're going to get to scale. So don't think about how you're going to get your 100th customer or how you're going to get your 1,000th or 1 millionth customer if you're thinking that big, but rather think about customer number one. Um, customer number one to me is your singularity moment. That's when you go from creating value out of nothing. That's when you, you, you actually create something that causes somebody to stop using something and start using what you have. And that's an amazing moment. That's, that's, where, that's a moment everyone should celebrate. Not many people do, uh, but that's a moment everyone should celebrate. Now, of course, you can't celebrate for too long because one is never enough. You have to get a lot more than one customer. So you have to get back to work pretty quickly, but it's still a pretty significant event. And that's a great way to think of your riskiest assumption. So if you ask yourself, if you go back to 2006, what was the riskiest assumption for Elon Musk and Tesla? And the riskiest assumption, I'm just gonna give you the answer. It's not the infrastructure. It's not how can we build over 1000 vehicle. It's not all the charging infrastructure, but rather it's what would it take for somebody to stop buying a combustion vehicle? And when they are in the market, consider, seriously consider an electric car and maybe even go for it. So we already knew that at that time, global warming was a thing. There was already um, lots of uh, um, reports out there. Al Gore had done his talk and there was all this, uh, this talk about carbon, carbon dioxide emissions. So there were people already beginning to, to buy hybrids for that reason. Um, gas prices or petrol prices were also rising and so people were switching for those reasons. So we knew some of that was happening. 
But if you ask ourselves, what would it take to buy an all electric car? The first question somebody would ask you is, how long does it take to charge and how far does it go? And that right there was problem number one, is that back then the technology for batteries wasn't good enough yet. You could charge a car over many, many hours. It took six to eight hours, uh, but you could only go 50 kilometers on one charge, which for a lot of use cases here in the US and other parts of the world is just not enough. And, and there, was a, there was a concept that, was, that had come out there, people had written about, called range anxiety. Is if I bought this electric car, I would be worried about getting stranded on the side of the road because I wouldn't be able to get back and there would be no charging stations and what would I do? And so nobody would buy this car because of that anxiety. And so Elon Musk and his team had to solve that problem and that became their riskiest assumption, that became the problem to solve. Now once you have that clarity, once you know what is the first starting problem to solve, it simplifies a lot of other things. They didn't worry about uh, the brand or the infrastructure or those types of things. They said, let's ask ourselves, how do we solve this one problem? And by doing that, they realized very quickly that what they were really trying to build that was different, their unique value proposition, wasn't really a car at the end of the day. It was really a battery. Um, if they could build a better battery, they could put that in a car and sell that car, an electric car, and that's precisely what they did. So kind of fast forwarding the story, um, Elon Musk and his team went to another car company, in this case, Lotus Motors, and picked a vehicle, and this was the, the Lotus Elise. It's a, it's a nice looking sports car, a very expensive sports car, but they went to them and said, give us permission to retrofit a battery into your car, and in exchange, we'll, we'll, we'll pay your licensing fees. And Lotus went for it, and that's what they used. And so this is a classic example of thinking about riskiest assumptions first, um, not trying to get to building your own car and making it perfect and all those types of things, but really distilling it down to what is your riskiest assumption, what is your unique value proposition, and bringing that to light. Um, so I like this example because it's a large-scale MVP. Uh, they may not call it an MVP, but it has that same elements of, uh, of an MVP. And it's basically, it's in, in the lean startup world, we'd even call this a, con uh, a Wizard of Oz MVP because it's cobbled together if, if nobody knows that this is a car that, uh, that, that was licensed, they would think that, that Tesla built this car in three years, and that wasn't true. Um, by taking this shortcut, they didn't have to hire automotive engineers, they didn't have to get a factory, they didn't have to get good at building cars or design a car even, uh, because all those things were working, all those things were already available. They were able to speed up the learning process and this continuous innovation mindset um, of, of putting a product to, to, uh, to, to market pretty quickly building the battery first. Once the battery got good enough, there was actually a stage two and a stage three for Tesla as well. And if you kind of look up their story online, you will see that after this car, they built the Model S, which was a car they built themselves. And then after that, they built the Model X, which was kind of an intermediate, but then they built the Model 3, which is that realization of their vision. So that's their mainstream all electric car that was priced at a $35,000 price point. Um, and that's what they are beginning to roll out. They're already cars that, are, that, are, that you see on the roads uh, now here in the U.S., and they're beginning to roll that out in, 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 a, in a more massive scale um, in the coming months. Um, so that's kind of a, a, hopefully a simple example. I, I picked a very big one because it, it, it kind of illustrates this concept that even if you're using hardware, um, you can apply these techniques because I see that a lot. I see lots of people will use a software example, and then people would say, well, I can see how this can work for digital, but how does it work for services? How does it work for hardware? and we can find ways for it to work as well. It's all about not necessarily going as fast as Facebook or Amazon, like the examples I gave, but really going faster than your closest competitor. If you can outlearn your competition, uh, you stand to win. So hopefully that was kind of a good uh, starting intro. Um, we've got still some time left, so I'm gonna turn off my slides, go back to um, kind of where I, the, the view where I can see you, and then happy to take any questions you guys might have. Great, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Ash, and the example was great. Great. Can you see the uh, room now? Yes, I can. Okay. So, uh, I'll kickstart with a couple of questions, Ash. This is Sashi. We talked last yes. week. Yes. Yep. <laughs> really appreciate you spending time. No, I know your day started with us and your day. <laughs> so, we really appreciate you taking time. So, you know, the last uh, concept, right? last mindset of falling in love 
the polyglot the problem not the solution you know this already uh, been said in the old adage necessity mother of invention you know fall in love with yeah. necessity and not the invention right but what we find especially in india with a lot of engineering mindset is that even on the canvas most of them define the solution <laughs> and then try to retrofit the problem you know to, to fit the solution so in yes. eyes on you know how to go about for these guys yes and 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 that's actually um funny enough it's 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 new research that i'm doing it's actually potentially a a new book that i'm going to write and that is why i i try to you know try to drive that point home a lot is that what you're saying is exactly right i see this not just with with technical people but just in general is that if you ask people to create a canvas um and say don't think about the solution it's impossible and our minds we already know we want to build something and if you have a hammer in your mind everything is a nail and so we begin to fake or invent the problems now if you take that scientific approach um and you and you are disciplined in testing that is still um just thinking about problems to me is still progress because if you are willing to test you will learn in maybe a few weeks but at least it's weeks and not months or years that the the problems that you thought were the right ones on the canvas no one really cares about um if again you have to learn how to do the interviews correctly and that's where some of the techniques with customer development help known as leading questions so there are some interviewing techniques that you and some principles you just have to keep in mind so you don't fall into the confirmation bias so that's helpful but in more um more recent years is another approach which is this idea of jobs to be done or outcome driven innovation which i find to be particularly insightful is that let's not even start with problems let's instead go and study how are people achieving outcomes so if i even take the uber example or ride sharing um if you went back 10 years and asked 10 people you know what are your problems with taxis you wouldn't get very good answers you they, they, they probably wouldn't be anyone really being emotional about their their taxi riding experience but today if you ask people at least in different parts of the world they get very emotional they'll tell you exactly why they like one versus the other um so for me sometimes until a solution comes into place you can see the problem and solution combination but you could still study that so it's the famous henry ford comment it's what steve jobs has said many times which is not the customer's job to know what they want we have to extract that so what you want to really do is study how are people hiring a particular product like in this case a taxi or in the henry ford case horses and carriages and what undesirable effects are there so with with taxis you know there's anxiety you know is someone going to pick me up uh, what if i solve that somehow what if i now that we can put things on the app and that's what the uber guys really did it was not meant to be this massive um you know large worldwide phenomenon when they started it was just something that they encountered they built in silicon valley they they kind of used it for themselves and it spread pretty pretty quickly so we can take kind of some of those simple problems and begin to even find big opportunities just by starting this process in a, in a small fashion um but but i would recommend for anyone out there is there is some newer work we we are actually working at lean stack on a newer canvas the customer forces canvas you can find that on my blog where i share some of these more i call them more advanced techniques for uncovering problems but even if you just went with the the approach of let me just write problems on my canvas and go and validate them like as a scientist to me that is still progress as long as you're willing to be disciplined and test for problems and look for evidence um you will still quickly tell that maybe these are not the right problems there are other problems we should discover yeah so i, I agree in in fact one of the things that we're planning to teach this cohort is empathy you know applying the design thinking te- techniques to to find you know that problem because yes in that those entrepreneurs who actually felt the problem created better companies then you know empathizing with the problem that they don't necessarily it can still be done so yes using your terminology fall in love uh, with the problem and it's easier to fall in love if you empathize you know yes with the problem so just as a for i we're going to teach them design thinking to find finding you know those problems and falling in love with the problems okay yes so, and, and and i i i think that's right on yeah absolutely yeah so we're going to open up for any other question Okay. I mean, I have I have another question I can ask you. Yeah, okay. I, yeah. I'll ask <laughs> for in the context. So you talked about starting with a 
bunch of lean canvases. And most of these startups think we are very constrained with uh, all the resources. So how do you yeah. prioritize those, those set of uh, lean canvases? Yeah, so, so they're, they're obviously at some point there needs to be a prioritization. So sometimes these are variants on the same idea. And so what I mean by that is that maybe there's a, there's a particular technology like blockchain or Internet of Things, but there could be many different applications. So sometimes they are different variants of, this, of a similar you know, either solution or to me solution is dangerous, but really more of a customer kind of area, like what, what problems do customers really have. Now, in the picture that I showed very quickly is there was a bunch of this parallel testing in, in, in the beginning. The problem solution fit stage, um, at least when we, when we run it with entrepreneurs, we try to emphasize no building. So it, it, when, we, when we run boot camps, we actually have a no building role. You actually have to go and find a customer without building anything. So it's not, it's, so the old approach was let's build something, then let's demo it and let's sell it. In this new approach, it's more, let's start with a demo. So you can demo things. And so you don't need to build something to demo something. You can verbally describe something. You can show screenshots. You can show conceptually what it is you're going to deliver. So show the outcome. Describe how it is you're going to achieve that outcome. And if a customer gets excited, then you may potentially have a customer. So let's demo, sell. And then once we have enough sales, we then build this thing. Um, so when you're taking that approach, you, you, you're cutting down a lot of the downtime of construction or building. So you can go in many different canvases in parallel. Um, so we have built, you know, we, we have taken three or four different ideas and run them through parallel. The biggest um, uh, time that's spent there is setting up customer conversations. So you're scheduling meetings, you are spending 30 minutes with each one, you're running lots of interviews. But if you are focused on just doing that, in a span of two to three, four weeks, sometimes at most, you come back with enough insights to where you automatically narrow down on just one canvas and decide that's the one you're going to carry forward. Thank you. Yeah. Any questions? I have a question. Yeah. Um, so you said you need to find those which are worth solving these for sure. Yeah. yeah, if you could take the mic back, please. Thanks. Can you hear me? Yes. So you said you need to find doors which are worth solving, you know, finding keys for instead of building a key which has no door. Uh, but another school of thought says that customers themselves don't know what they want. Uh, for instance, the Steve Jobs, if you went around asking, you want a one touch phone, a lot of people could visualize it. So, what's your take on that? Customers themselves don't, not knowing what they really want. Yes, and, and, and that's why I'll, I'll, I'll point you to, to that, you know, design thinking or kind of jobs to be done type of thinking is that we don't ever ask customers what they want. Um, and that is almost a recipe for getting a bunch of feature lists which they will not even use. Um, if anyone has, has dealt with customers and looked at your backlogs, customers too have the same bias, is they fall in love with a solution that they think of, but they don't understand their own problems. That's the reason why we go to doctors and therapists sometimes, is we, we need someone to extract that out from us. Um, so you're almost playing that role. Now I make it sound very complex. There are some, some simple questions and, and one of it is really asking, if I just jump a little bit into the interviewing technique, we don't want to measure what customers say they will do in the future. So we don't ask those leading questions like, if I give you this, will you use it? Or tell me if you like something. We instead look for things they have done in the past. Um, so if they have tried to do something, tell me that story. Tell me what did you try to do? If you try to plan dinner and movie with five friends, which is the famous, which is an example I like to use, um, then I want to talk to you because I'm building something to solve that problem because that's a hard coordination problem. Um, it's hard enough to set up a meeting with two people or more than two people. To do dinner and movie with five friends, it requires lots of choices, lots of people to agree. Um, anyone in the room here try to do that? Maybe just a quick, maybe show of hands. Anyone here try to, to go on dinner and movie with, with maybe three people in the past? So this is a classic example. The people who raise their hands, those are the ones that I want to talk to because they can tell me something about that experience. And in there, I'm going to find the problems. Everyone who didn't raise their hands, you aren't my early adopters. You may become users of my system in the future, but the ones I want to talk to are the ones who went through that. And that's the way that we start the process is we ask people about their experiences. And that's a lot of that design thinking mindset is let's go and explore what are today's experiences 
what are the alternatives today? How are they failing in doing this job? If everyone is satisfied, if everyone was successful, maybe there's no innovation here. But I'm guessing that there were some problems in that conversation. And if I can find them, that's what I need to really uh, focus my, my thoughts on. And that's what Steve Jobs did very well, not by necessarily interviewing people, but by observing. Um, he would observe a lot of problems with existing products. If you watch every one of his demos, when he was talking about the iPhone or the iPad, he wasn't talking about 10 new things you would do with the, I, with the iPad. He would talk about how it is better than a laptop or how it is better than a smartphone. So he was always comparing it to other products in different categories because that's what people understood. And that's where they could see problems with their existing product, like a laptop I can't take to bed and I can't just read casually in bed, um, but I can take my iPad and I can read an ebook in bed, for example. Um, so that, that's, that's something to keep in mind. So, uh, uh, Ash, uh, one, one last thing from me is that uh, one of the fascinating things about this cohort is that we have a SaaS startup, we have an AR startup, we also have, sure. dog, we also have dog food startup, we also have <laughs> skate or scooter type of a startup. So, which is That's correct. so one, of the, one of the things with the lean uh, you know, momentum, right? is that a lot of people think it's for software, it's for tech startups. So, you know, what are your observations and thoughts about applicability of this methodology or mindset for non sure. an SME type of a, you know, idea? Yes, yes, and, and, and that's one of the reasons why in the past I would always, you know, give some kind of a software example because it's the easiest one to show, but there are so many of them and that's why I started with the big, like the, the, the whole Tesla example to show how one can go fast even in, in such a big regulated industry. Um, but, but, the, the, but the mindset is yes, as long as you are dealing with customer uncertainty, as long as you are trying to uncover these problems, you can apply a lot of this type of thinking. Um, and so, so for me, there isn't a domain. We have, we have seen this applied in even medical devices. We've seen this applied, you know, hardware services is even easier. I mean, some people worry about services, but services are actually easier to test because you've got that human, human learning side of it is you can go and deliver a service and learn a lot and then look to see how can I make it repeatable and scalable after that. Um, so, so if there's a particular like challenge, if, and then maybe we can open this up to the room. If, if you think your idea cannot work with this methodology, then you know, maybe raise an objection and we can try to see if there's a way we can, we can take on that challenge. Yeah, that's a great idea. Any non-tech guys, you know, do you think it's applicable or do you see any challenges in the language? Yeah. So we have one baker ash coming. Okay. <laughs> so uh, uh, I am a robot speaking. So we are speaking louder. Louder. Can you hear me? Yeah. Go ahead. So uh, I'm Ramnath, I'm from uh, Team Global Uh So we are a medical devices package. So one of the things uh, that uh, uh, many of the, uh, okay, so we are in the in vitro fertilization uh, idea, basically. So we have uh, developed a device which will improve the outcome of the patient. So that is a, uh, if you could speak a bit louder still, I, I, I can't hear um, everything. Ours is a medical device. And okay. For the IVF industry. IVF, in, in vitro so, fertilization. So in okay. So one of the challenges that we face as a hardware company, hardware medical devices company, uh, are the kind of regulations that you need to be uh, uh, in line with even before you can approach, uh, say, the medical uh, software or uh, devices and the uh, stakeholders. Say, for example, you would have to uh, have done the n number of tests even before you can. Uh, even, even before they can actually try it on a human uh, subject. So, uh, in, in that case, there are kind of more shortcuts, quote unquote, uh, like, are, are there, or uh, can you uh, find us to some references where uh, we can see how? So, you mentioned medical devices in your list of uh, where lean, can, lean methodology can be applied. So, it would, it would be great if you could just uh, go ahead. Sure. So, so I, I guess maybe if you can if you can re, re, rephrase the uh, the the specific kind of industry or solution that that you have. We are uh, uh, making a device to improve IVF in vitro fertilization, especially baby. 
So Ash, uh, just, I, I, I'll, add, I'll add some clarity because I've seen, uh, it's a fascinating company, by the way. We feel okay. excited about it. What they're doing, see the, uh, the uh, in vitro fertilization is very manual. Uh, you know, they have to have talented people to insert, you know, I don't know all the technical terms. These guys are sure. trying to automate that with uh, using some robotics. Okay. okay. Um, so, however, I think his question was that it's full of regulation. You know, before you go yes. experiment and prototype, they need to yes. make sure they are in line with the regulations. So, how okay. is that applicable is the question. And one other yeah. question, how far can you get with the lean? So, yeah, I mean, how, how far can you go with the lean approach, you know, before sure. you actually try it? Yeah. Yes. So I, so I guess, uh, and so this is again, if we bring the, if we bring the riskiest assumption mindset into this, um, I would almost say, and the question that's in my mind is the unique value proposition. So I understand there's, you know, some better technology here, but does it increase the, the, the likelihood or the, the probabilities of fertilization, right? So that to me would be question number one. And if, by how much, right? And so even if it's a lab gas or, but to me, like those are what get someone's attention. Um, those will get the attention of the people who are trying to get, you know, pregnant. They'll also get the attention of the people doing the procedures. But to me, it's like trying to lead with that and, and try to then ask the second question, which is, you know, who are the customers and what are the channels and how would you start to use this? And so when we look at the business model as a product, you know, as you're describing this regulation, but regulation to me is really a challenge of time, money, effort is, you know, you have to go through your clinical trials if the technology will go through its paces. Eventually, you will get through those types of things. You know, big pharmaceuticals go through that. Um, even building a car like Tesla, they have to go through all of those types of things. But those are not the riskiest things. Those just take time, you know, money, effort. The riskiest assumptions here are going to be what will cause switching. So if there's a manual procedure today, what will cause somebody to want to adopt this new, in the beginning, experimental thing? Because it's new, it's never been done before. You know, who is that early adopter? Um, is it somebody who has tried the manual procedure, you know, two or three times? To me, that might be someone who is more willing to try something new. Um, and of course, what is that value proposition? So there's some stuff you can start doing in parallel. And this is where when we have got these long lag times, whether it's with an invention that's not ready to be used with, with patients in this case, because it has to go through the clinical trials and the process, you know, what can we do in parallel that can de-risk the business model? Um, there's an extreme example that I have in mind. It's a, it's a company in Switzerland that was building this dental compound that was helped uh, that would that would reduce cavities in uh, in infants. So and so obviously infants don't aren't born with cavities, but in some cultures, um, mothers add milk, uh, sorry, sugar to, to to the milk to to make the babies drink, and then their their permanent teeth come out with cavities. And so this was a way to to solve for that. Uh, but they spent four years doing all the clinical trials. They got this ready for use with humans. They went to the dentists and said, you know, we have got this compound. We'd love for you to sell it um, in, your, in your clinics to your patients. And the dentist looked at them and said, are you crazy? I mean, we make most of our money from cavities. Why would we sell this product that would take business away from us, right? And that was a risky assumption that they faced four years down the road, and they had to go back and spend several months trying to find a new distribution channel. They could have done that day one. They could have gone and talked to the dentist and said, we are building this. It's not ready yet, but this is what it will do. Are you interested in helping being a channel for this? And they would have said the same exact thing. Um, so that's, that's a way to kind of you know, simplify it, but I think it gets the point across is that there's a lot of things you can still do on that canvas in parallel, and they might even be the riskier things. Because I do think that if your technology is, is right, you will get through the, 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 the clinical trial portion, the regulation portion, but the bigger risk, and that's not, it's not gonna be easy, but it's, it's doable. Uh, the bigger risk, of course, is who are the customers, maybe even price points, you know, what is the price point of this? If it's 10 times as expensive, but only gives me a 2% increase in probability, you know, am I going to really buy this? And so again, those are the concerns or the questions that I would be exploring at this stage. So we could say they found a hole or a cavity in the business model. <laughs> <laughs> sure. So any other questions? Or how are we at time? I think we must be getting late. Yeah, outside. Yeah, I think I, maybe we should wrap up. Yeah, you, can, you can close with your question. Quick question. We'll close Last question. Yeah, there's a, if there's a last question, I'm happy, happy to do that one more question. Yeah, yeah, last question. Just the last question. <laughs> Hi. Um, 
So uh, as the product scales, you know, as, as your user base also scales, uh, when you've begun in, in the beginning, your, your focus is very narrow when you're building the lean canvas. But over a period of time, as the product begins to scale, uh, your user base tends to become less homogeneous. Yes. Uh, you know, so how do you deal with that problem? Because <laughs> multiple lean canvases uh, and you do that all the time on the fly. Uh, you know, because ideally you want to be able to focus as much as possible, but over a period of time, you tend to attract a lot of users. You yes. Have different requirements and you don't want to keep growing the product as well because then that will be too difficult to manage. Yes, and so well, well, so I would say that the scaling is always a, is always a, an option. It's always, it's, it's always a, a choice, and it's sometimes you know it's, it's a good problem to have. Like for most of us, we don't get to that beyond the chasm phase. If you look, if you're following Jeffrey Moore's chasm, is we we often have a product which not enough people use, and it just doesn't reach to that point. But definitely, when you reach that point, um, you have a choice to stay focused um, with one segment and go really deep with them and take that to a limit. But if you start, if you have ambitions of going mainstream, you are going to have to um, consolidate your problem, your, your products in some way. If you, I use Apple early on as an example. Their early adopters were mostly creatives. Now they build more mainstream products. And while they still have that creative edge, there are many products that they discontinued, sometimes to the, to the anger and resentment of the creatives because they wanted those products still. Uh, but Apple says there's not enough of a big, there's not enough business model. We have to put our focus on the bigger market, and so you do those types of things. Is as you go more mainstream, you begin to look for what are the bigger problems, what are the more common problems, and the segmentation becomes broader. But it's still uh, around certain jobs. If you look at you know what Facebook does, or if you look at any of these companies, Microsoft, Google even though there are many different segments using them for many different things, there aren't, you know, million combinations. They are really still a set of things that come to mind when we think of those brands. Um, Facebook is I want to stay in touch with people, right? And, and so that is either friends or I'm a marketer and I want to reach, uh, or, I'm, or, or I'm some kind of a, uh, I have a platform and I want to reach my fans or audience, but it's really about that connection. And so the feature set is not, you know, doesn't explode infinitely but definitely your focus does and your marketing will. Um, so that's what you want to keep in mind. So the art is trying to figure out how do you expand your, your value proposition by maybe um, diluting it a little bit, but it's still focused around certain jobs that you're trying to get done, which still stay kind of true even as you get to, to large and large scale. Um, and it's a good exercise. If you look at all those brands I talked about, and you ask five or six different people why they use it, it's a great way to see that the, sometimes the answers begin to run each other, is that everyone uses them for certain things, and that's just what all branding is about, is you know, how, how we think of certain brands. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, Ash. Thanks a lot for your time. Yeah. All right, sure. You're welcome. Yeah, Ash, thank you very much. Really thanks, appreciate Ash. this pleasure. All right, well, have a great uh, rest of the day and hopefully we'll, we'll see each other in person sometime. Yeah, yeah definitely, Ash, when right. you are in India. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye.